take the stage, Lucas Kafir. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, welcome, everybody. With this presentation, I have to be very, very good. I don't know if you can hear me OK. Can you? OK. So good evening. Um, tonight, I would like to introduce you to a very interesting topic, uh, two dots. One dot is the invention, and the other dot is the innovation. And I want to talk to you about the, the line that connects these two dots. So. I have divided my uh, presentation in three parts. I want to talk to you about the uh, invention, the concept of invention and patents. And then in the second part, I want to introduce you to the concept of invention and innovation. And then in the third part, I want to introduce my idea about the IP revolution that we will probably be facing in the next 10, 15 years. So the first question is uh, to invent or not to invent. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the concept of invention. Invention derives from Latin, invenire means to find, so ideally to invent means to find something. But from a legal standpoint, inventions are th something different. So an invention is a technical solution to a technical problem. As long as you find something that is new, that is non obvious, or it has an inventive step and is also industrially applicable, then in that case you can probably obtain a patent. Well, uh, patenting is not a sin. That is all the, all the times that I meet my friends, scientists, and technologists, and they still think that you have a dichotomy. Either you can invent or you can uh, publish a paper. This is not true. Uh, and so this is usually the sentence that I hear. But uh, I want to publish. You still can. This is the answer, because you can just work in parallel with your patent attorney, with the people in the university, with the people in your research center, and you can still keep your publication there, and you just have to work in parallel, and then you can, at the same time, publish your findings, and you can also get a, a patent if you're lucky. And if your idea is good, then maybe you can also make money out of that. And then I also hear this other uh, sentence. I believe in uh, accessible knowledge. I don't want to have patents because I want that uh, all the world can benefit from my ideas. And this is also another mistake, because actually you can still have a patent. Because if you don't patent, someone else is going to patent, maybe in another country. So the idea is, for example, that you can get a patent, and then maybe you can just license it for free if you want to help developing countries. So the answer for me is always me too. Uh, well, so I already told you what is uh, a patent. A patent is a legal monopoly that is granted to the to the applicants for a limited period of time. And uh, what is also uh, interesting is also the word patent derives from uh, Latin. So in Latin, we have the expression litere patentes. Litere patentes means open letters. So at the time, in uh, medieval times, uh, we used to have this notary public. Uh, and they used to uh, draft these documents, which means open documents that were accessible by anyone. And so this is the same thing for a patent. It's a document that you can actually consult and you can use to increase your knowledge because you maybe just not get additional information from other publications, but also from patent. And maybe you can have even uh, better ideas. Uh, so what you give is your knowledge and the patent office ultimately will give you a patent. And the good thing is that you can still make your results accessible because uh, the point is that people will actually see uh, your findings and will probably uh, get additional information and they will work on this information and they will further also their research. Uh, and then I also hear this other sentence, a patent is a bad thing. And my answer is, really? Okay, so my idea is, is a bomb a bad thing per se or just when you say kill people? Uh, I just want to give you uh, a brief story. Uh, probably most of you know Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel uh, gave birth to the Nobel Prize. He was a philanthropist, and he was, most of all, uh, a great inventor, was one of the greatest inventors, actually, because he died with more than 300 patents. And do you know what he did? He invented dynamite, and dynamite was a way to store something that was very, originally, very harmful, uh, nitroglycerin. 
So he turned something that was potentially very harmful in something that could actually be used in a proper way. So, and this is the same concept of the bomb. It depends on how you use it. So a patent is like a bomb. You can use it to improve our lives or to make them worse. And patenting is not enough. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So then you have to go down below because you might have an idea, but having an idea doesn't mean that you can actually make money out of it. Doesn't mean that you actually can commercialize it. So, and then we enter into the second part of my, uh, of my speech in which I would like to talk to you about the difference between invention and innovation. So to me, it's a personal view. Uh, one is theory, invention is theory, and the other is a fact. Invention is something that can be conceived by one or more people, and innovation is uh, a, social, uh, a social thing. So I have my two equations, invention equals theory, and innovation equals fact. Uh, then the other question that I have is, can research center or universities innovate? In my view, the answer is no. But they should facilitate, though, the transition between theory and practice. Okay, but how? And this is the funniest uh, part of my presentation, I guess, because now I'm gonna give you some rules. First, you have to make people uh, communicate. In many research centers and universities, I've seen researchers and scientists that actually do not speak with the people that are in charge of patenting procedures. So you have to have a system, a cohesive system, in which you actually have people that can talk and that can share ideas. And then I have a second rule for you. Uh, you have to build the right team. So the people that should take care of the patenting procedure, the commercialization of the technologies, of the findings of research, they should have completely different skills. And this is a problem in this country, for example, because in Italy, we don't have all the skills that are required and that usually people have, for example, say, in the US. In the United States, you have uh, technology transfer offices, as they are called, uh, with people skilled in marketing, in business administration, in law, um, and of course in all the technical fields because these people actually meet every day the scientists, the researchers, the inventors within the university. And this is a problem outside of the ES. This is a problem that is also related to the uh, way we train young people. Because, for example, in this country, in Italy, it's kind of inconceivable that you might have a person with a PhD in chemistry and also with a law degree. In the US, this happens. The third rule is you have to create a network. You cannot, have, you cannot think of having these people working for technology transfer offices uh, not knowing people from industry. They receive requests for filing uh, applications to get patents, and then what they do? Most of the times they just get these patents into the drawers and they just get dust. So you actually have to have people that can have a dialogue with people from industry. Innovators uh, do not work in universities, in my view unless, of course, they start their own venture. And we have many, many examples of researchers and professors that also were skilled in uh, entrepreneurial activities, in business activities, and they decided to also pursue this kind of uh, career. Then I have a fourth rule for you. Uh, you have to be global. This means that we cannot afford nowadays to think that we start from Italy and our market is Italy. You have to think about a world that is completely borderless. So you have to start talking with people in China if you know that uh, someone maybe can uh, commercialize your invention, your technology in China, or Japan, or Korea. And so, for example, one of the uh, greatest problems nowadays that I could actually face and understand is the lack of communication. You need uh, a language that everyone can understand, anyone can speak, and unfortunately, I'm Italian, but that language is English. I have a fifth rule for you. You have to be fast. That's why uh, we live in this world that is completely borderless. Information travels at the speed of light. So if you don't do something, someone else is gonna do it, maybe in Bangalore or in Seattle or in LA or in San Francisco. The sixth rule, one of the most important, is that you have to understand different cultures. Uh, what I realized, for example, traveling to Japan and trying to understand the 
knowledge transfer uh, system because I like more the expression knowledge transfer rather than technology transfer because you can share and transfer knowledge by realizing the so-called uh, knowledge triangle starting from study, research, and innovation. Uh, so you have to respect different cultures because we are different. When I was in Japan, all my attitude, all my habits were completely sometimes not understandable by the Japanese audience. And the seventh rule, which is in my view the most important, is that you have to respect different cultures. So first, of course, you have to know. And secondly, you have to respect. My third part uh, is probably the, can be the most controversial and regards what is in my view the IP revolution that we will be facing very soon. So the IP revolution will uh, make us change everything. So for example, let's imagine a world without humans. Yes, it's completely black, it's pitch black. Now imagine though our world in 2020. With 3D printing, we will be able to make our ideas reality. We will face a paradigm shift in intellectual property as we know it now in 2011. So for example, let's imagine a day in which we will print our clothes. And I'm not kidding. We will be very, very soon uh, seeing stores with scanners and they will probably take the measure of our feed and our full body, and so we will be able then to uh, print, 3D print, these clothes at home. Because what is predicted is by 2020, every household in the US will own a 3D printer. And as a feedstock, you can actually use plastics, bioplastics, and all the metals that you can think of. But now, let's imagine a day in which, which we'll actually print mechanical parts. It's already reality in San Francisco. In California, I have seen last summer 3D printers that can actually print mechanical parts, that can actually function. You can put them together and they can work. But in 2020, let's imagine a day in which we will print electronics. And this is going to happen. Nothing can stop this future. So we will be able to, for example, print at home a computer. Or and not an MP3 player, probably we'll be able be having, I don't know, an MP7 player, but that's one of what is going to happen. And so the idea of intellectual property will completely uh, change and licensing IP will increase exponentially. We will license the right to be the creators of patented and trademark goods. So for example, we will just choose from our 3D monitor with holograms, for example, something that we really like from a fashion company and we will just buy the license to manufacture at home a t-shirt, a pair of jeans, a pair of sneakers. And so we will actually license the right to recreate the logo of this company that it probably will be trademarked. And the same thing is going to be also with things that are patented, like a computer, as I told you. So this is the IP revolution in my view, and it is coming sooner than you may actually think. Thank you.